This is a Trafficware Commander. It is the ATC platform put out by Trafficware to run ATC cabinets, or you could run uh, NEMA cabinets based on the configuration of the controller itself. So this model here, um, it could either run a NEMA TS2 Type 1 cabinet, or it could run an ATC cabinet as long as it has the SIU interface board. It does have a touch screen, you know, that, that other controllers do have. It has a graphical interface, um, which you would see if you were doing a web browser login to it. But traditionally, traffic technicians like the, the classic menu-driven screen just for ease of uh, navigating. Well, to bring you through the steps, first thing you'd want to do, hit the home key so that you're at the main menu. You're, you're going to find in these controllers that you're going to bounce to the main menu a lot. Um, just in terms of navigating through the structures, uh, the menu structures. <clears throat> so I'll start off at the main menu. First thing you want to do is shut the run timer off. The run timer is basically the internal run time clock that would be used to either uh, turn the controller on to run an intersection or certain features you have to shut the run timer off like if you're going to initialize the database in this case if we want to start off with a clean uh, standard eight um, ring structure we want to we want to um, initialize the database so I'm going to go main menu I'm going to hit one for controller seven for enable run and you're going to see there's an option for runtime status and the change to so as long as the cursor is on the change to section, you can hit any number key to toggle it from on off. Once you do that, you'll hit the enter key and you'll see the runtime status will update to off. So now you know the controller is not trying to time, it's not trying to process through any timings. So now that you've done that, we'll hit the home key to go back to the main menu and you're gonna go into eight for login. <coughs> And then option four is going to be initialize. So when you go in there, it's going to give you different options of what you want to do. Now, if you select number one for database, it's going to bring you to a screen where you can toggle through different functions. You can do a full clear if you want to zero out all the data. You can do a full standard eight, which is going to populate. It's basically going to populate the ring structure with all eight phases that you would typically use at an intersection. <laughs> Other options are full diamond and then uh, basic comms. And honestly, some of, these, some of these are going to be like Caltrans configurations, but for the most part, you're going to just stick with standard eight. <clears throat> so we'll go back. So we'll select full standard eight. We'll hit the enter key. It's going to give you a warning about overwriting database settings. Hit enter to continue. <coughs> so it tells you right now the initialization is complete. You just have to hit the escape button or the back button to go back. Escape button here. Actually, you can just go back to the home screen. So now we want to go back from the main menu. Hit one and then seven for enable run. We'll toggle that to back to on and we'll hit enter. The run timer is now on. So if we go main menu seven and then one for timing, you basically have a controller that's been initialized for standard eight operation. And it's, it's not trying to communicate to any cabinet components. So it's just sitting on the bench right now, just running, waiting for other things to be activated. So next what we're going to do now that we're going to talk about mapping uh, phases to load switch outputs. So we'll go to the main menu and we're going to select one for controller and then option eight is channel IO and option one is channels one through 16. So this screen will allow you to map phases to the first 16 channels of a cabinet. If you have more than 16 you would have to select option two for channel 17 through 32. So it's pretty straightforward when you're looking at this screen. So load switch channels are along the top for the columns. You can see one through eight is displayed. You can cursor all the way over. And I'll show you nine through 16. So in order to, in order to assign them to phases, you'll see on this row here, you've got a P slash overlap. So this is going to 
this is where you're going to assign what phase it actually runs. So because we defaulted this for a standard A intersection, it pre-populates 1 through 8 as vehicles. Now, if for some reason you wanted channel 1 to be phase 5, you just simply change that to 5. And of course, we wouldn't want to run phase 5 out of more than one load switch, and then you could zero that out in the event that you wanted to. That's not pretty stand, you know, that's not common practice, but it does offer the flexibility of doing so. So if I go back and change this back to the default values, the next row down is the type. So this is where you can actually select what is this channel going to be because not all outputs are phases. So on this row you'll see that by using the number keys you can toggle through either vehicle, a ped channel, an overlap, and those are the three options that you have. So if you were to be running an overlap, let's say out of channel seven, and it was overlap one, you would toggle this to overlap, toggle up, change that to a one, and now channel seven is operating as overlap one. My preferred method is to go through and zero out any channels that you're not going to use. <clears throat> so if we weren't using any channels, or let's just say we wanted overlap one to run out of channel seven, but not out of any others, any other channels, you could just zero them out and that now disables that, that load switch output. So in order to map detectors, um, we'll start right at detectors one through 16. So we'll go to the main menu. We're going to select five for detectors. And then you're going to have different options here. The first one is vehicle parameters. You're going to have your detector assignments along the left-hand side. And then you're going to have what phase it actually calls in the next column over. Once again, because we, because we initialized the database for standard eight, it pre-populates some of this, but if it was if you were to match it up to any intersection plans, you would simply work your way down. Let's say you want to detect a one to call phase five. You'd select phase five, go down. So let's say phase, you know, phase detector two can stay phase two. We'll leave that. Let's say detector three, we want that to be six. So as long as you input a value and either hit enter or just cursor off of that value, it'll lock it in. If you try entering a value that it doesn't allow, that's outside of the, the value parameters, then it'll, it'll give you an error. So if I were to try to put call phase, you know, 62, <coughs> it beeps at you saying, no, it's not going to do that. So then you just have to add, you just have to reset it to a value that it would allow. So. If there's data in there, you may have to put a zero first. So I like to go from 24 to a four, I had to put in zero four to overwrite both, both values because that, that's a double digit value that it can accept. <laughs> uh, real quick, the, the, next, the next column here is detector switching. Detector switching is just simply the fact of if you want, say a left turn detector zone to call and extend the left turn, but then, but it's a, a left turn straight through combination lane. If you want it to time the left turn, and then once the left turn's done and goes to red, that detector then can extend the straight through phase. So it's kind of like you can double duty the detector. You would assign that. So in this, in this example, you would potentially have, you know, detector one will call phase five, so it, so it, processes the left turn and when it's done with the left turn it would then extend phase two. Other options you can set delays for like right turn zones in case you want to delay the, the vehicle call you can extend um, and then on this screen over on this side so the fact that there was an arrow the fact that there's a, a little greater than or less than sign up here just indicates to the user that there's another menu that lives in that direction. So these options here, no activity, max presence, erratic count, 
those all count towards TS2 detector fault diagnostics. So if you did have, let's say, if you wanted to put values in here and you wanted to monitor a vehicle detector for being on like a broken loop, let's say, for, for simple, simple terms, you could put like 60 minutes in there. And if it, if it saw that that detector was active for 60 minutes, then it would declare TS2 detector fault. And it would then look at this t fail time parameter to determine how long that detector stays active. <clears throat> Most times, you know, you, you can use that to mitigate how long a, a broken detector uh, constantly calls. So now we'll, we'll uh, discuss how to map detection in a traffic wear commander controller. So we'll make our way to the home screen. <clears throat> so from the home screen, we'll want to hit five for detectors and one for vehicle parameters. So along the left-hand side is your detector number, your detector input number. The next column over is going to be your call. What phase is this detector going to call? This option can range all the way to 32 because this controller is capable of operating up to 32 phases. Typically, you know, you would start out with your, you know, your typical phasing, but it's completely user configurable. <coughs> the next column over is your detector switching column. So let's say you had a combination left turn straight through lane and you wanted the first traffic, you know, the first cars that are sitting on that detector to call and extend the left turn phase, then that's exactly what it would do. So like in this situation here with detector one, it's going to call and extend phase five up to its max green time. And then once phase five terminates, it's going to now take and use that same detector input to extend phase two, which would typically be running concurrently with phase five. <coughs> Uh, the next column over would be delay in case you wanted to place any delays on a detector for like right turns, you know, so that you're not changing the lights unneed needlessly. The next column over is extension. Um, queuing, once that detector has been active for up to a certain number of seconds, say 15 seconds, then it stops placing a call on it. So if you only want that detector to, to allow so much of its time, you could limit it using that queuing factor. This screen over here is for TS2 detector, diano TS2 detector diagnostics. Um, no activity, max presence, erratic counts, and then a fail time that would be applied to this. So you can set different values in here to make a detector um, declare, you know, if, if, the, if the right criteria takes place, like a max presence of 60 minutes, then the controller would have the ability to fail that detector. <clears throat> it would then use this fail time parameter to determine how long do you actually want that failed detector to call and extend that phase. So if you, let's say that phase typically has like 20 seconds on it, but you don't want it to run that 20 seconds every time it comes up in the cycle, you can select like 10 seconds. So if that detector is considered failed, then it's gonna call, it's gonna service that phase every time, but it'll only do it for 10 seconds rather than the full 20. So in order to run this controller as fixed time with no detection, the first thing that you'd wanna do is go to the main, main menu and you would basically use the phase options screen. So if we go into the main menu and then one, for controller, one for phases, and then two for options. Basically, this is gonna tell you the screen where your enabled phases are. So in this case, phases one through eight are enabled. And in order to run at fixed time, you would either place min or max recalls on, on their respective phases, and they would operate under those preset times that are in the timing menu. So. If you place a min recall on a phase, it's gonna run the five second min green. If you place a max recall, it's gonna run the 25 second times that are in for that phase. So the, the min recall setting basically just means that 
that you're going to, you're calling that phase, you're overriding any detection or if there is no detection and you're basically forcing that phase to come up every time, every cycle. So the min recall just simply makes it call the min green time, in this case five seconds. Or if you place the max recall, it would do the same thing, call up that phase every cycle and it would run the max one time of 25 seconds. You to put min and max recalls in from the main menu, we'll start off at the main menu. We'll go one for controller, one for phases, two for options, and then you would scroll down, select min recall, toggle off of it. If you wanted a max recall, you'd come down to this line, hit any number key, and select the max recall. If you wanted to deselect it, you just simply highlight it again hit the number key to deselect them. So in order to set up scheduling, time of day schedules on a TrafficWare Commander Controller, from the main menu you'd want to start off at, um, you'd want to start off at two for coordinate and then one for modes. <clears throat> it's very important that the operation mode be set to zero. When that's set to zero, it basically tells the controller, look at your hierarchy of commands and do whatever you're being told. So if you were talking, if this local controller was talking to an on-street master, it would, it would place that master's pattern commands above its own time-based scheduler and it would run whatever the master would run. Most controllers are just gonna have a time-based scheduler. So you would want that set to zero. If, it's, if it was set to like a pattern number, then it will run that specific pattern number 24-7. So we know that the op mode is set to zero. We'd want to go back to the main menu, hit four for scheduler. First thing we'd want to do is set the date and time. So current date and time is on the top row. We would want to set the bottom accordingly. And you have to type out all the digits. So even though today is the 19th, I'm just going to re-enter 04-1923, cursor off of it it will automatically populate the day of the week. And then we would go in and change the time. Right now it is uh, 1, 1 12 p.m. So we use 24 hour clock format. So we would want to put in 13 12. And now our controller is running current date and time. We'll escape out of there and we will go to the easy schedule. <coughs> So the easiest way, simple, simple way to do a time of day plan would be to come to the easy schedule, select the days of the week, and as you cursor through, you can either select individual days of the week, you can select Monday through Friday, or you can select all days of the week. So that tells it to run Saturday, Sunday through Saturday. Typically, you would want to put in the months of the year, which would be 0, 1 to 12, so that's January through December. And then the days of the month, you would put in the 1st to the 31st. If there is no 31st, it just ignores it and just goes to the 1st of the next month. So now we've told it we're going to run day plan 1 is going to run all days of the week, January through December from January 1st to December 31st. We're then gonna come into the day plan. It's gonna ask for a day plan. You're typically gonna start off at day plan one and hit enter. Now, these controllers are very logical minded. So, so after we've set up the easy schedule, I would go into the action table next. And this is where you're gonna link the actions in the in the daytime planner to certain patterns. Now this pre-populated patterns one through eight. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the, the predefined patterns of 254 for free operations. So in this case here, if we just wanted to run free operations 24 seven, I would take, I would like, typically I would zero these out And I come down like pattern four, change, change action four to pattern 254. 
Might as well zero these ones out while we're there. So now we have action, action four is mapped to pattern 254 of free operations. We're gonna hit escape out of there and then we're gonna go into the day plan. So four for day plan, it's gonna ask for a day plan number. So you'll hit number one and then hit enter. And now it's gonna ask you to fill in the day plan. So we know that we set day plan up to run Sunday through Saturday, January 1st to December 31st. If we just want this to run free operations all the time, we're going to call up action four because in the action table, we already set action four up for pattern 254. Now in the event, so in this case here, it's going to run free operations all the time. If we wanted to actually call up a time of day, like a coordination plan, then what we would typically do is let's just say, let's say we've created a coordination plan number one, we would link action one to pattern number one. So now that we have that defined in here, we can come back to our day plan, day plan one, and we could tell it, you know, you always want to have a midnight command in there. So we would keep the midnight command at, as action four because that's pattern 254. And let's just say we wanted to run pattern one from six o'clock to nine o'clock and then go back to free operations. So that's what your day plan event would look like or your day plan would look like if you wanted to run free other than plan one from six to nine a.m. To set up IP addresses, we'll start at the main menu and we'll hit six for com, and then we're gonna hit five for IP setup. In this screen here, you can set up your IP address. So for a simple setup, 192.168, say 1.1. .1. The next line down is your subnet mask. So we'll just put some standard subnet mask parameters in here. Once again, as soon as you enter the information, just toggle off of it. You do have broadcast IP, which is typically not used, but if you do have a default gateway, you can also program that in if you have a router in your system. <clears throat> so now the other options that you have on the screen would be if you want this controller to only talk to a specific host IP address, you can then lock down that communications like a whitelisted IP address. And if you, if you leave it open, it won't, it'll be an open whitelist. But if you do place an IP address in there, then it will only talk to that IP address. So in order to turn certain um, software modules on, we'll start out at the main menu. We're gonna go to eight for login, four for initialize, and then option two is gonna be run options. And this screen here, it'll show you what software modules are, are available on this controller. So in order to turn certain options like transit, we would just toggle, you know, if it says available on the right hand side, then it means that you can activate it on the left hand side. So we'll just scroll down, we'll turn on transit, we'll turn on DSRC and emergency. <clears throat> so you just turn on which options you want, want to enable in the controller. When you go to leave the screen, it's gonna send you a message to say that you need to reboot the controller. So what we'll do, we'll hit back, we'll go back to the main menu. This just means rebooting the controller, simply means shutting the run timer off and then turning it back on. So after we do that, we turn it back on. We'll go back to the main menu. I always find it best practice to just go and double check and you'll see that it shows that those modules are, are available and ready to be programmed. Oops. Hmm. <laughs> Once you verify that your DSRC is enabled on the controller, you'll need to navigate to the COM menu, option six, and you should have a menu labeled option nine DSRC. 
you're going to go in here. Basically, you just simply need to set the IP address of the of the FMU that the controller is going to be communicating to. So we'll just call this 1.10. <clears throat> and then you'll also have to uh, identify what port it needs to talk to. You can get that information from whoever you're, whoever's doing your connected vehicle um, equipment. So to set up emergency vehicle preemption, we need to start at the main menu and hit three for preempts. It's going to ask you, do you want to, you know, you have to select either high priority or low priority preemption. In this case, emergency is high priority. So we'll select which preemption we want. We'll select number one. And these are the menus that, that you have for options. So number one is times. This is where you would set up any delays or max presence. Um, many times you'd want to set something in here, 120 seconds for a max presence. So if there's an emergency vehicle that's pulled over and it's, it's a optical emitter is hitting the, the receivers, It'll ignore it after two minutes rather than continually preempting the intersection. Ped clearance. If you're going to shorten, if you have an emergency preemption and there's an active crosswalk, you can determine whether or not to shorten that ped movement. Um, this option of 255 ensures that the controller will maintain the rest of that ped clearance because as far as I know, you're not allowed to shorten that. Under emergency vehicle uh, preemption, you can shorten the min walk. So you can shorten the walk site, uh, interval of it. Min green, you can basically guarantee how long, um, how long a phase is going to get its min green time if the preemption comes in during that interval. Many times, you can set that to 255. That will use the the pro the the min green time that's already in the global timing parameters. You can shorten that. There's a track green time in case that you have a railroad approach and you need to clear vehicles off of it. You can play. You can program how much time you want to give that phase. You have a min dwell time, which is basically how long do you want to be in the min dwell interval? Ten seconds is pretty typical. After you've programmed that, you would want to hit escape and then hit two for phases. So now you're going to determine which phases need to operate during uh, preemption number one. If you if you did have a track clearance phase, you would you would program that in right here. Um, if you don't, and this is just optical preemption, then you're just going to come down here and determine which, which phases can run. In this situation, we'll program phases 1 and 6 to run under preemption 1. Anytime you see a plus sign at the bottom, it simply means that there's more data fields down here. So down here, you can program all kinds of uh, dwell vehicles or dwell peds. You can also program your exit phases. So when you leave preemption, um, those are the phases that it goes to. We'll hit escape. You have three for options. These are, these are different options on, on how it processes the preemption. You can lock the input or you can not, depending on your preference. Override auto flash basically means if it's in a nighttime flash, do, do you want it to come out of flash and service it? Most agencies that I'm aware of don't want that. They want to just stay in flash. This override higher preempt option, that allows you to prioritize different preemptions, one being the highest, six being the lowest. Or in this case, with these controllers, I think they can do 12 high priority preempts. Flash and dwell. Some agencies actually want the intersection to go to flash during preemption. Make sure that's toggled off. And then if you have a complicated preemption run, you can actually link this preemption to another preemption number. So after that, I'll hit escape. Four for times. There's different parameters in here that you want to set. Typically, you would want to match up 
your these are your exit clearances so you would want to match up whatever's programmed in the controller um, I'm just guessing that that's what you'd want <laughs> you know that that's a typical set of yellow and red clearances um, extend dwell and just simply means that once the active preemption signal stops how long the controller will artificially extend after that signal is dropped uh, return max is just a matter of if you want it to um, return from preemption and you want to place max recalls. <laughs> Five is overlaps. You would just simply define any overlaps that are supposed to um, run during this preemption. Um, track, track overlaps, dwell uh, overlaps, that's pretty straightforward. Options plus. This is where you would enable or disable overlaps. Uh, uh, this is where you would enable or disable preemptions. The type of preemption is in here, emergency. I don't remember what LRV is. <clears throat> I think it typically is emergency. Oh, light rail, gotcha. The different types are emergency and light rail. And then on the output side, you have TS2, delay, dwell, and off. TS2 would basically be to operate your confirmation strobe. That would activate it as soon as the preemption call was received from the controller. Delay is if, the, if it's timing a delay interval, it would turn it on then. And dwell is once the preempted phase is green, turn on the confirmation strobe. There's also several other um, options in here about the only other one that would be used fairly commonly would be the coordination plus preempt that just means that once it's done with the preemption it would look at vehicle detections and exit to what phase would typically be up during that part of the cycle instead of the exit phases that we programmed preemptions can be processed either through the cabinet interface itself through like an optical preemption card um, or DSR um, or through NTCIP commands from the FMU. Um, it's going to call up this preemption. It's going to run the same parameters either way. First showing up to an intersection that's in flash and you're trying to diagnose the problem. Um, from, the, uh, from the main menu screen, I would want to start at seven for status and one for timing. This is going to bring up the actual status of the intersection, what it's trying to do. If, if the traffic signals were in flash, then typically there's going to be a stop time input applied. The controller, would, the controller would relay this information by saying stop time down here. And it's actually going to pause the controller where it was at the moment that the, the fault occurred. So that will at least give you an indication of what phases were active at the time. So in the event that you find that your controller is, is the problem for why your intersection is in flash, then the first thing that you'd want to do is take a USB and put it in the USB port, and which probably, if we had one. <coughs> Once that USB stick is in there, you'd go main menu. So main menu, eight for login three for disk utilities and you have option four is data key backup so you would hit four with the USB stick in there and that would write that database to this controller once that process has been done you can take your replacement controller take this one out put the replacement controller in and then you would put the USB key back in it now there are certain folders folder structures that have to be put on that USB key. Um, that would be right in the manual on what folders, what directories need to be on there. Um, and so once you've put the new controller in, put the USB in, you navigate back to eight, three, and then five is data key restoration. So you'd hit five. It's gonna tell you, <laughs> it's gonna tell you if you have to, that you have to sh turn the run timer off. So from the main menu, we'd go one, seven. We want to toggle the run timer off. 
hit enter. We would then navigate from the main menu, eight, three, and then five for data key restoration. Go in here, it'll ask you if you're sure. You would hit enter. If there was a data key in here with, with a good uh, configuration file on it, it would then upload that. To work with dynamic max timing in the controller, you, you are basically just allowing the controller to automatically ramp up its, its max screen time based on vehicle demand. So in the general timing screen, main menu one, 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 if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, as you go down through all these all these, when you get to the bottom, you're gonna have two options, dynamic max limit and max step. So if you were to add time in here, let's say, let's say the general max one time is 25 seconds, and you wanted this controller on a specific phases to be able to ramp up, let's say to 50 seconds on phase two, we'll just say phase two and six, you wanna run 50 second dynamic max, you would place 50 seconds in there, and then this max step is what increments you want it to be able to grow or decrease by. So pretty typical would be like five seconds or maybe 10 seconds. So we'll place five seconds in there. So the way that dynamic max works is that once that phase maxes out, if it's running free operations and that, that phase maxes out two times in a row, if the, the, if the max screen time is 25, it'll automatically step that max screen time up by five seconds to 30 seconds. If that approach continues to max out another two times, it'll add another five seconds and bring the max screen time up to 35 until it reaches all the way to 50. At that point, it, it, max, it tops out, it can't go any further, but then once you start seeing gaps in traffic, it'll start, as soon as it gaps out once, It'll start bringing that down by five seconds until you're back down to the, the max screen time. I'm Josh Schmidt. I work for VHB out of the New England offices. Uh, I might see you out in the field sometime, and i um, happy I could help.